Hello, I'm Bob Mack from World Class Beer, and we're here today to talk about the world history of beer. The history of beer is really a reflection of world history. The oldest evidence available to us indicates that human beings have created and consumed alcoholic beverages since the very beginnings of civilization. In fact, it is even possible that civilization itself was a byproduct of our ancient ancestors' desire to drink beer. The earliest evidence for the presence of alcoholic beverage in human society dates to around 9,000 years ago in the Neolithic Jiahu site in northern China. Archaeologists led by Dr. Patrick McGovern of the Penn Museum discovered burial sites containing pottery shards stained with the residue of an ancient alcoholic beverage. Chemical analysis of the pottery shards confirmed the presence of fermented rice, honey, and fruit in the ancient jars. While the Jahu site beverage was not strictly a beer by modern standards, it definitely indicates that early societies had the skill to create fermented beverages. The early Sumerians were brewing beer and left many references to it in some of the oldest known writings. This stone tablet dates to around 3000 BC and was found in southern Iraq, an area then known as Mesopotamia. The first known written language found in Mesopotamia is Sumerian, the language of this same tablet. In Sumerian, you can see references to both beer and eating. Beer is referenced by a jar atop a pointed base, while eating is referenced by a human head with a bowl tilted towards it. Barley was an important food source for the ancient Sumerians, and domesticating barley and other plants allowed them to leave behind their hunter-gatherer lifestyles and found modern, civilized communities. Ancient Sumerians also composed the historic Hymn to Ninkasi. The Hymn to Ninkasi was found inscribed on a 19th century BC tablet, and the hymn contains a recipe for Sumerian beer. Ninkasi was the Sumerian goddess of beer and alcohol. To the Sumerians, she was known to satisfy the desire and to sate the heart. While we know that the Sumerians were eating barley and making beer with it, we don't really know what motivated them to domesticate barley in the first place. Some archaeologists believe that it was their desire for beer and fermented drinks that led early peoples to develop agriculture. Is it possible that civilization itself began as an organized attempt to gather supplies for brewing beer? In his book, Uncorking the Past, The Quest for Wine, Beer, and Other Alcoholic Beverages, Dr. Patrick McGovern speculates that the quest for beer may be what led early people to develop the basic components of civilization. Several reasons are proposed to suggest why this is possible, including we first find evidence of alcohol usage in even the earliest known civilizations. Brewing beer was relatively simple versus making bread or other foods. And the effects of alcohol were just as attractive to early people as they are to people today. Through many centuries following the Sumerians, beer continued to be a staple beverage for many civilizations, including the ancient Egyptians and to many Europeans through the Dark Ages. Our modern word beer actually comes from the Saxon word for barley or bear. During the Dark and Middle Ages, beer was a staple beverage for many people. A scarcity of reliable, fresh water made beer very important to almost everyone, as beer was much safer to drink, in general, than water that was often contaminated or diseased. The boiling of beer in the brewing process, plus its alcohol content, made it a fairly safe and secure source of water for everyone, and it was cheap enough to produce that it could be made available to most people. Brewing in the Middle Ages was mostly done at home or by monks at monasteries. In fact, the oldest currently operating brewery in the world is the Weinstefan Abbey Brewery in Germany. St. Benedict of Nursia in Italy is known for being the founder of Christian monasticism as he created the rules by which monasteries formed. While anarchy reigned through most of Europe and education and industry stagnated, monasteries preserved knowledge of and pioneered many important elements of community life, including agriculture, baking, and brewing. Through the Middle Ages, 
monasteries became the first commercial breweries as they began brewing to support the communities in which they lived. Many monasteries brewed beer for their brothers and for the local populations. Over many centuries, monasteries pioneered new beer styles and supplied beer to the masses. Today, some monasteries in Europe still produce beer commercially and sell it to support their charitable endeavors. Hops were introduced as a brewing ingredient sometime during or before the 8th century AD, which is the earliest known time during which hops were cultivated. Hop cultivation was first documented in the year 736 in the Hallertau region of Germany, also a hop growing region today. The first recorded reference to hops dates to Pliny the Elder in the 1st century AD, but it was not used in the production of beer at that time. And prior to hops, beers were seasoned with many different spices and seasonings. In Europe, an herb mixture known as gruet was commonly used to season beer. Beer seasoned with gruet was often referred to simply as gruet. The widespread use of hops began in the Middle Ages and continued to gain popularity through the 14th and 15th centuries. For a time, unhopped beers and hopped beers existed side by side until the popularity of the hopped beers made unhopped beers virtually obsolete. In England during the 15th century, unhopped beers were often known as ales, while beers that had hops in them were known simply as beer. Today, both of those words have a very distinctly different meaning in the beer world. In 18th century Europe, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing, and the conditions it created led to the commercial production of beer on a large scale. Large urban populations brought millions of people to cities like London, where the demand for beer for working class citizens became enormous. For many years, pubs and inns produced their own, usually low quality beers, from whatever ingredients were handy. However, as manufacturing techniques and transportation methods improved, it became more and more attractive to business owners to form breweries as a commercial venture, and eventually large scale breweries started producing beers like porters and stouts that were wildly popular with a mass audience. In fact, the name Porter was a reference to the common day laborers of the period, also known as porters. Prior to the 17th century, malt drying was done over open fires. This caused the malt to create dark, murky colors in beer as it picked up many contaminants and smoke from the open fires. Around 1650, a revolution in oven fuel technology changed all that. It was called coke. Coke is coal that has been baked to remove unwanted compounds, so it burns very cleanly with little or no smoke, which makes it an ideal fuel for ovens. As coke-fueled ovens began to be used for malt kilning, it became possible to produce malt with very few contaminants, and which made the malt very light in color. In turn, brewers in the 17th century were able to produce pale ales that were much lighter in color than the common dark beers of the time. Early 17th and 18th century pale ales were not typically pale by today's standards, but they were usually amber or dark gold in color. But compared to the very dark beers that people were used to seeing, these new beers were pale indeed. Until the 19th century, brewers had created beer with little to no knowledge of the yeast that created alcohol and carbon dioxide in the beer. Over the centuries, trial and error had allowed brewers to create beer with such limited knowledge, but in the 19th century, science was becoming more aware that yeast played a role in beer, although what that role was exactly was still something of a mystery. In 1840, Anton Dreher, working at a brewery in Vienna, Austria, succeeded in isolating what we know today as lager yeast, or Saccharomyces pastorianus, from other yeast strains and brewed a beer with lager yeast only. His beer, known as a Vienna lager, was the first true lager beer. In previous centuries, brewers had produced lager beers, but with little or no knowledge of the yeast that was in them, so they made no effort to brew with pure lager yeast. Therefore, lager beers prior to 1840 were made with a mixture of various yeast strains, even though they were sometimes brewed in a lager fashion, utilizing cool temperatures to ferment and age the beer. In 1842, a German brewer working at a bohemian brewery in what is known today as the Czech Republic made heavy use of newly available pale malts and of lager yeast to produce the world's first truly golden beer. Joseph Grohl's beer became a huge commercial success as it dazzled the beer-drinking public. 
Brewers all over Europe began imitating Grohl's Pilsner beer with varying degrees of success. Several other classic beer styles were even born out of those attempts to imitate the Pilsner style and to cash in on its commercial viability. Grohl's beer, known as Pilsner Urquell, is still brewed today, but was the first of the style of the beer known today as the Bohemian Pilsner. Up to and through the Middle Ages, the production of beer was a very localized and laborious process, which meant that the beers of the time were often of dubious quality, inconsistent, and confined to a small area. A variety of leaps in technology starting in the 17th century, which continued through the Industrial Revolution, raised beer to a higher standard of quality and made many different beers appealing and available to many parts of the world. Glass began to be produced on a widespread basis during the Industrial Revolution, and it started to replace ceramic stone and other materials from which drinkware was made. For the first time, drinkers could clearly see their beer. This put a lot of pressure on brewers to keep impurities out of their beer and allowed the public to enjoy pale and golden beers for their appearance. Transportation advanced rapidly as first steamships and then trains and later trucks became available to quickly transport beer from the brewery to the consumer. Brewers could now successfully sell beer in faraway cities. And microbiology was also advancing rapidly in the 19th century. Notably, Louis Pasteur discovered and explained many aspects of the role of yeast as it relates to fermentation. This led to a much better understanding of yeast and their role in the brewing process, which gave brewers more information with which to refine brewing techniques. In the 19th century, large populations of European immigrants settled in America, and many of them took their traditional beer recipes with them. Brewing at home, or even starting commercial breweries in America, they quickly found that some of their traditional ingredients were very expensive or unavailable to them. So brewers started to make Americanized versions of their traditional recipes, and beer recipes evolved to work with the ingredients that were available. As immigration to the United States grew, brewers sometimes found that their customers, largely composed of diverse ethnic groups that had also emigrated to the U.S., found it hard to appreciate the traditional beers of specific regions from the Old World. And in order to stay in business, many brewers found it beneficial to brew lighter, less intensely flavored beers that would appeal to a wider audience. In this fashion, the very diversity of the American population actually helped to stifle the diversity of the beers that were being brewed in the U.S. Eventually, these beers with more mass appeal created commercial successes in breweries around the world, and the mass-produced beers we came to know in the 20th century began to dominate the world beer market as early as the 19th century. By the early part of the 20th century, alcohol was being blamed for many social and economic ills in countries around the world. This caused political pressure to increase on many governments to reduce or even to eliminate the consumption of alcohol. This movement, known as the temperance movement, was successful in getting alcohol banned in many countries. Countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Mexico, Finland, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States ultimately prohibited the production and consumption of alcoholic beverages. Ultimately, prohibition largely failed at reducing social problems related to alcohol in most areas, as the demand for alcohol simply forced alcohol into a black market world that created as many social problems as it solved. But consumer preferences had changed, with many people now opting to drink at home instead of at bars and taverns that were considered unseemly. The few brewers that had survived prohibition quickly shaped their products and business strategies to appeal to those changing consumer preferences. At the same time, new technologies were introduced to many consumers that shifted their drinking habits. By the middle of the 20th century, many homes had electric refrigerators, making it convenient to keep beer at home. Also, beer bottling and canning technology continued to advance, making home beer consumption even more appealing and convenient. The world wars of the 20th century made a large impact on beer as well. As ingredients were rationed, brewers were forced to use less barley and hops and started making lower alcohol versions of their traditional beers. In this way, the world wars and ingredient rationing strongly encouraged the creation of lighter, less flavorful beers that the public ultimately embraced. The result of the turmoil of the early and mid-20th century was a beer culture that was dominated by large brewers brewing similar, lightly flavored and moderately alcoholic beers. 
This situation persisted for several decades until a new generation of consumers grew up without the immediate memories of prohibition or of world wars, and they were eager for choice and variety. By the 1960s and 70s, more and more people were traveling internationally and discovering unique beers in many parts of the world that were unavailable to them at home. Many travelers found that they truly enjoyed beers that they discovered in their travels and missed them upon returning home. Some beer aficionados started to brew at home to make styles of beer that they desired but which they could not purchase in stores. Ultimately, many of those home brewers became very good brewers and some of them started to brew commercially and established some of the well-known craft breweries that we know today. Public interest in and understanding of a beer world beyond what was being offered by the major brewers was also fueled by increasing access to information about other cultures that was becoming available through mediums like television and the internet. By the beginning of the 21st century, information of all sorts was becoming immediately available to almost everyone, including beer recipes, descriptions, and reviews. This access to information led to even greater interest in new beers and beer styles that lent public support to a rapidly growing number of new brewers in the U.S. and around the world. By 2010, the number of breweries in the United States had eclipsed the number of breweries in operation prior to Prohibition. As I record this presentation in late 2011, the number of breweries in the United States has already hit the 1800 mark, up from less than 50 in the early 1970s, and hundreds more are in the planning stages and will be opening in 2012 and beyond. There is little to suggest that this growth is going to stop anytime soon, and it is a trend that is present in many other countries. The vast majority of the 1800 brewers account for only a small percentage of actual beer production, but it is a number that is likely to continue growing. The percentage of craft beer consumed in the U.S. grew by 11% in 2010 to reach 4.9% of overall beer consumption. And the big brewers, makers of the most popular beers in the world, continue to dominate the market with major brands, but they have also increased their presence in the specialty beer world as they produce more and more brands designed to appeal to drinkers looking for beer variety. The big brewers have gone further with production of their own entries into the specialty category and have also begun to explore partnerships with craft brewers. With consumer demand for specialty beers continuing to grow, this trend will also continue. Thank you for spending some time with us today learning about the world history of beer. I hope this presentation was helpful and informative.